With many countries lifting restrictions on foreign travelers, it was my first time traveling overseas after two years. And the first country I decided to visit was Jordan, a place that has been on my bucket list for the longest time. My first day was spent in Jordan's capital, Amman, and so I had to visit the Amman Citadel, an archaeological site that dominates one of the seven hills that make up the capital and contains remnants of different cultures throughout the civilizations in Jordan. The Jordan Archaeological Museum exhibits collections of artifacts from various locations all over Jordan. We took a short walk over towards the Umayyad Palace. The palace complex was built over the remains of Roman construction and was used as an administrative center and governor's residence. Housed in a lovely old villa with a terrace garden, Sufra serves up traditional Jordanian cuisine. With Sufra, translating directly to table, the restaurant's name reflects Jordanian hospitality, where they tend to prepare a Sufra whenever they host guests. The next day, we took off to Wadi Rum, located about a three to four hour drive away from Amman. Wadi Rum is described as the place with an uncanny resemblance to Mars, due to its reddish-orange hues and unique rock formations. The settlement over 2,000 years ago by the Nabataeans, an Arab Bedouin tribe, hides historical sites throughout the desert. While the Bedouins living there up until today make Wadi Rum a place that is overflowing with culture. We stayed at Sun City Camp, a hotel that offers both a traditional Bedouin camp experience and bubble hotel rooms as if you're out on Mars. Setting off on our first Jeep tour, our first stop was Lawrence's house, the place where T.E. Lawrence, or Lawrence of Arabia, reportedly resided during his time in the desert and was built on top of a pre-existing structure built by the Nabataeans. Next stop was Little Bridge. Spanning about four meters long, it is one of Wadi Rum's most popular bridges that's easier to climb. Umfroth Rock Bridge was the next stop we made. Another popular rock bridge for jeep tours. Rising up 15 meters above the desert floor, the climb up to the bridge starts off quite steep but can also be climbed in about 10 minutes. The last stop was Mushroom Rock, a unique sandstone formation that makes for a great photo opportunity. Every night, the camp serves up food cooked in a zar, a traditional Bedouin underground oven. Having a warm, hearty and smoky meal straight out of the zarb made this one of the most satisfying dinners in my trip. The next day, I had my first camel ride experience. For Bedouins, camels were extremely important to their survival in the desert. Whether it be carrying heavy cargo or walking for miles across the desert, camels were considered a gift of God. I had a few hours to spare before a sunset jeep tour, so I spent the rest of my afternoon exploring the areas around the camp. I loved the freedom that came with exploring the desert. It felt as if I was completely free to roam around anywhere. 
At around 4 p.m. we made our way to the filming location for The Martian, which had such an amazing panoramic view of the desert. Afterwards, we headed off to one of the sand dunes that could also be an amazing spot to watch the sunset. Not too long of a drive away, you will find petroglyphs inscribed by the Thamudic and the Batian people over 2,000 years ago, depicting their movement by camel caravan through the desert. Last stop was a stunning Barasik before heading off to chase the sunset. Sitting over the rock edge and watching Wadi Ram sunset was probably one of the most beautiful sights I had ever seen in my life. Not to mention, stargazing in Wadi Ram is also something you should put on your bucket list. Our time at Wadi Rum was up and we headed off to Petra the next day, a city built over 2,000 years ago by the Nabataeans. The trail starts off the same for everyone, a one kilometer walk until you reach a bridge beside a modern dam built over the Nabataean dam to stop flood water from flowing through to the Sikh, a gorge naturally carved out by water, stretching over one kilometer. As we neared the end of the Sikh, the magnificent facade of the treasury began appearing between the rocks. Because it was forecasted to snow on my second day there, I had to complete as many trails as I could in one day. We made our way up to the urn tomb, thought to be the tomb of the Nabataean king, Malchus II, which was then later converted into a church. After the Nabataean civilization, Petra later fell to the Byzantine Empire. The Petra church is a prime example of architecture in Byzantine Petra. Here you will find extremely well-preserved mosaic decorations, lavishly covering the church floors. Next, we began making our way to the monastery, which consists of a one-hour hike up about 800 oddly spaced steps, in addition to the 8km trail we had just tried. This is one of the more challenging hikes, but as soon as you reach the monastery, it's absolutely worth it. A monumental rock-cut structure believed to have been a place of worship, the hall was later converted to a Christian chapel by the Byzantines. I left feeling accomplished and descended towards the main trail for a 10 km return back to the visitor centre. After a short rest at the hotel, we returned for Petra by night. The most magical and memorable experience to end our first night in Petra. The Nabataeans built an advanced water management system which transformed the city located in the middle of the desert into an oasis to support a substantial population. We made a quick stop to see how this structure was carved out on our way to Little Petra. Archaeologists believe that Little Petra was built by the Nabataeans as a suburb of Petra, where successful merchants lived and entertained their visitors. It later fell vacant and was used by the Bedouin tribe, evident from the smoke stains on the compound ceilings. Keep an eye out on a set of stairs on the left that leads you to one of the very few Nabataean painted interiors to have been preserved through the centuries. As the snow got heavier, Petra Museum was the perfect place to be. Despite all the archeological finds, 
Petra still remains a mystery where much of the city is still being discovered. We stopped at my mom's recipe for lunch. And the sweet tooth in me also had to try the decadent desserts as well. As soon as the weather began to calm down, I had to go back to see the treasury once more. This time, I had the whole area to myself, away from the crowds. I also hiked up to Aneshu tomb, and the tombs nearby that caught my eye on my hike back the day before. and ended my afternoon at Cave Bar, the oldest bar in the world occupying a 2,000-year-old Nabataean rock tomb. On my last day, I headed back to Rainbow Street in Amman for a lunch stop at Najla restaurant. There is no menu here, so you will be seated and presented with an array of home-cooked dishes making that lunch an extremely hearty and comforting meal. Hidden at the end of a set of stairs is a cozy cafe that overlooks a stunning view of Amman. I also had to try the famous falafels here on Rainbow Street, which definitely lived up to its name. In downtown Amman stands Duke Stiwan, one of the oldest well-preserved stone buildings located in the heart of the city with the most stunning interior. We made our final stop at Kama Local Gourmet, I highly recommend this place if you're looking for something special to bring back home. With an aim to bring together food, culture, and design, Kama delivers an authentic touch of Middle Eastern flavors in its gourmet products. What I love most about Jordan is how it offers a glimpse of everything. A rich culture and history, intriguing archaeological sites, untouched natural wonders and desert landscapes, delicious food, and last but not least, the kindness and hospitality of the Jordanians.